so uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, let me thank I mean the uh, uh, Kerala Agriculture University for inviting me uh, to this webinar series on forestry and environment education in India, uh, and to share uh, some of my views. And of course, especially with regard to the various uh, challenges and opportunities. Now, uh, what I would really like to appreciate is that you know, I, I had a long association with the uh, College of Forestry, and I would like to specifically thank, I mean, uh, Dr. Uh, Vidya Sagaran, the Dean of the uh, College, and also uh, Dr. Chandra Babu, the Vice Chancellor for, of the Kerala Agriculture University, for providing me this opportunity. You know, uh, it's always a pleasure to sort of really interact with uh, friends and uh, colleagues. I mean, in the agriculture university. So whenever there is an opportunity, I rarely uh, miss that opportunity because I, the association has been uh, rather very long. And uh, in fact, uh, I very well remember uh, when the uh, Faculty of Forestry or the College of Forestry was established. Uh, we were, of course, in the neighborhood in the Kerala Forest Research Institute. And uh, we developed a, a very close collaboration with the uh, Agriculture University, especially the College of Forestry. And in fact, I mean, KFRI opened, I mean, the doors uh, for a lot of uh, activities, especially for the uh, students, I mean, to sort of come and sort of see what is really happening. And we had a, a very strong collaboration. So I'm uh, really happy that, I mean, that, uh, you know, there's this close association and I'm, uh, you know, the, this association has been really well cherished, and uh, whenever I get an opportunity, I would I'm happy to talk to the faculty and the students on various issues. In fact, uh, uh, almost every year I've been sort of uh, coming at least once or twice. I'm into the uh, campus and sort of uh, uh, sharing various thoughts on that. So uh, let me uh, come to this uh, topic. Uh, I mean, the topic of uh, my presentation today is uh, making forestry education and research responsive to changes in the coming decades. Uh, you all know that, I mean, uh, it's a very exciting time, I mean, this time, because uh, when I really look back at the situation I, we faced, I mean, uh, in fact, I joined the forestry service, Indian Forest Service in 1969, and then I've gone through a, a series of, I mean, you know, I witnessed them I mean, during the last 50 years, a uh, tremendous amount of uh, changes. Now, when I look back, I'm in the situation, I mean, basically you are seeing that, uh, you know, it's very exciting times, and I, I think it's also very challenging. Now, uh, what I would like to say is that, I mean, uh, this presentation is largely a, a follow-up of uh, what, I mean, has already been uh, in, uh, you know, discussed. I mean, I think uh, Dr. Shibujos made an excellent presentation on the uh, changes in forestry education in uh, USA. And of course, he traced them I in how it has evolved over a period of time and how they adapted, I mean, to the various uh, changes. Now, uh, subsequently, last week, uh, we had uh, another a very good presentation by uh, Mr. Noel Thomas uh, dealing with the whole issue of uh, forest policy changes. And again, uh, it uh, sort of laid all the background uh, for the, all the changes that have taken place. And especially, I mean, he brought out, I mean, the uh, complexity of making uh, policies in a kind of uh, changing situation. Now, I don't know whether you remember, I mentioned during his uh, presentation that uh, in 1988, uh, I was in the ministry uh, looking after forest policy. And this is when the uh, 1988 forest policy was formulated. You know, at that time, it was pretty simple, I mean, because basically you draft a forest policy, you go through a kind of uh, internal discussion. Uh, I think practically, I mean, we did not go for a kind of uh, uh, stakeholder consultation. Uh, you know, there was a very limited consultation, but now things have changed enormously. What you find is that, I mean, if you don't have a, a proper stakeholder consultation, I think you are going to get into a lot of problems. So the conditions have changed very dramatically during the last year, couple of few decades. And I would really like to sort of emphasize that these are the kind of changes that we have to capture uh, in terms of, I mean, how uh, education and research is undergoing. Again, I would really like to emphasize that 
we should not really separate between forestry education and research. Basically, it is a continuum. And I, I think we'll have to really keep in mind that uh, this continuum is maintained because uh, without proper education, there will be no research. And without research, the uh, you know, education also will not be sort of making progress. So rather than sort of the traditional uh, separation between education and research, we need to really integrate this and deal with that in, in a much more holistic manner. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, what I would really like to bring in is that, I mean, uh, there are two uh, issues, two major pillars of resource management. Uh, the first and foremost, now, for example, uh, we have been doing a lot of the uh, long-term outlook studies at the national level and also at the global and regional level. And what we find is that uh, the uh, society has to deal with two major issues when dealing with any kind of resource management, whether it is agriculture, whether it is forestry. I think these two are, for one first and foremost is governance, and the other is science, technology, and innovation. Now, improvement of governance and advancement in science and technology are very much depend on how we are managing our education and research system. Now, if you really look at, for example, say the governance issues, governance issues essentially implies we need to really focus on the policies, the legislation, regulations, the various institutions involved. And uh, this, of course, is not just confined to the national level. We have to look at the governance issues at the local level, even at the community level. We have to look at the uh, subnational level, for example, at the state level. And of course, at the national level, how policy are formulated, how rules are formulated, uh, how institutions have developed, how they are adapting to changes. And of course, this also applies to the global level. For example, uh, how what are we doing with the global institutions? For a, an issue like, for example, climate change, how are global institutions helping to govern the or manage the whole issue of climate change? Now, when it comes to governance, we have to also look into a broader issues of uh, governance per se, which of course eventually boils down to a number of issues like say accountability, uh, transparency, uh, uh, participation of uh, the various stakeholders, uh, justice and equity issues will be there, efficiency issues will be there. Now in all these things, <clears throat> what we have to really see is that what is the role of uh, education and research? Because if you don't have the right kind of education, I think we'll have a problem in governance because after all, uh, you are, for example, the agriculture university is educating uh, future managers, uh, future decision makers. So unless we have the kind of uh, solid grounding, uh, the governance is going to be affected in exactly the same way. If you don't have a good uh, 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 scientist, I think the whole sort of uh, uh, new developments are going to be stymied. So, I think there is this very close linkage between uh, education and research with regard to the uh, critical pillars of uh, science, of governance, and science and technology. Now, we are living in an era of a tremendous amount of uncertainties. Uh, I think we, this, we all, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a, a major challenge that uh, all of us are going to face. I mean, uh, you know, whether it is, I mean, the uh, emergence of pandemics, whether it is going to be conflicts, whether it is going to be wars, the trade issues. So the question that we have to really look at is, uh, in, in an era of uncertainty, what is the ability of our uh, education and research systems to develop the right kind of human capital relevant to the changing needs of our society and provide the science and technology inputs required to meet the current and emerging challenges. So I think the, this is actually the sort of uh, real issue that we'll have to address. You know, of course, I mean, the topic of um, uh, education and research is uh, so vast. And I think uh, 
pro I, will, I will not be able to even sort of address uh, even a small part of it within this uh, uh, 30 minutes or so. So I would rather sort of uh, focus on some of the broader issues rather than going into the minor details, because this itself is a sort of uh, topic for a series of seminars, you know, as to what kind of education system should be in place, how forestry education should be changed, how we sort of integrate with uh, uh, other disciplines, how we do cross-disciplinary research, you know, what kind of research is required, you know, this, this is a, extremely complex. So what I'll do is, I mean, I'll just focus on a few points on these issues, like say, what kind of uh, human right, human capital relevant to changing needs of our society, and uh, how do we provide science and technology inputs required to meet the current and emerging challenges. <clears throat> uh, now, the, the, the issue is that, uh, 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 you know, uh, what we have done, for example, say when uh, I came out of the Indian Forestry College, of course, now it is called the National Academy, uh, the uh, uh, National Academy of uh, uh, Forestry. Now, I mean, we were totally, uh, tra tra you know, trained in uh, traditional uh, silviculture and management, and a lot of the thrust was basically on the policing function of forestry. Now, uh, we we never sort of, for example, uh, during that period, that's a 69, 71 period, uh, we never heard about this word. Even we never talked about environment. We never heard about community participation. We never heard about the whole idea of uh, stakeholder involvement. So these are uh, completely uh, uh, out of the vocabulary of uh, forestry or forestry education and even forestry research at that time. Now, uh, when I first came and after the training, I joined uh, as a DFO in Palgat. And of course, my uh, first uh, posting was in uh, Palgat. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically at that time, Palgat was almost like what we call as a, a textbook division, where, of course, you had a lot of problems with the private forest, but I was in charge of the uh, government forest or the reserve forest. And uh, we were almost entirely doing the traditional kind of forestry. And uh, I must say that I was probably the last person actually to do uh, logging in Silent Valley Forest, because the entire emphasis was, for example, we had a lot of areas of tropical rainforest. I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the area like Silent Valley or uh, Atapadi, other blocks like Butikulam. And in fact, uh, one of my tasks was actually to sort of uh, supply uh, railway sleepers, I mean, to uh, you know, through harvesting the uh, you know, sele selection filling in this uh, forest in Silent Valley and Butikulam. Now, uh, the interesting thing is that even when we are uh, doing a bit of I mean, law and uh, uh, law enforcement and other things, we never had any idea of the social issues. So uh, someone who uh, were trained in, who was trained in the very traditional way, when you come and sort of confront the reality, you find that what you have learned and what you are practicing is completely divergent. And in fact, uh, uh, that's one of the reasons what I found was that, I mean, of course, I worked in Palgat for a few years, just about a, over a year. Then I moved to Trichur, and the Trichur division was, I mean, something uh, a completely opposite of what I encountered in Palgat. Uh, the thing is that you had all kinds of uh, problems, whether it is encroachment, whether it is uh, illegal logging, uh, political interference, you name anything. So. Uh, in contrast to the uh, uh, you know, what we have learned, uh, you come across a situation where 90% of your problems are actually uh, socio-economic and political problems. And this is where what we find is that what you learn or what you in which you are educated and what you are actually practicing, there is a tremendous amount of uh, divergence. Now, things have changed, and I think uh, uh, what we find is that, I mean, uh, there is a lot of, uh, at least some changes are really uh, uh, improving. Now, we need in, for the 21st, we need a 21st century knowledge system. And what for? Uh, to fulfill 
society's aspirations uh, uh, require a major overhauling of the concept and approach to learning in all sectors, including forestry. So the type of learning that uh, we have been used to in the uh, early part or the, even the latter half of the 20th century, I think that need to be sort of completely changed. Now, uh, traditionally, most of the sort of uh, forestry education and research are largely focused on the supply side. I mean, the assumption is that uh, you need uh, produce uh, timber, and of course, uh, there will be demand. You don't have to really worry about markets. So all of us, our attention was focused on sort of uh, producing timber. And uh, the, the, the problem has been that uh, to a large extent, we have uh, continued to sort of, uh, pr uh, uh, you know, although there has been some slight changes, I must admit uh, that there, ha there have been changes. But, uh, you know, you find that, I mean, uh, we, we, we have not been able to produce employable persons with the skill sets required to work with the stakeholders other than governments, especially private sector, community groups, and uh, civil society organizations. We have taken demand for uh, gra uh, for granted, and I think uh, we were rather comfortable to work with the government system because uh, basically it is a hierarchical system. Uh, decisions are taken on a more or less sort of uh, top-down approach, and uh, uh, I think a lot of trust was on law enforcement. Of course, the ones you have the kind of uh, rules and regulations, what should be done, what should not be done, uh, you know. It, it it sort of provides a certain amount of uh, you know you, you live in a, a comfort zone so i think uh, what we are now facing is that uh, the transformation of society is bringing about a lot more changes and uh, especially you know for example the uh, diversification of stakeholders very different kinds of demands and i think Technology is also contributing. Now, for example, in the 21st century, I mean, we are really talking about uh, tremendous advancements, like, for example, artificial intelligence, robotics, of course, remote sensing and other things you already know. So these kinds of technologies are going to make bring about fundamental changes in the way uh, people are looking at resources, their access to information, and, of course, how they sort of uh, require a, a, a very different kinds of goods and services. And I think this is something that uh, the system will have to really deal with. And uh, let me go into uh, look at, I mean, for example, how the world is changing, because uh, what we have seen, for example, uh, during the uh, first half of the uh, second half of the uh, 20th century, I think the change has been rather a slow process. I mean, as I said, for example, if you uh, prepare a forest policy, I mean, you remember, I mean, the other day, the lecture by uh, Noel Thomas, we had the 1952 forest policy, then it took almost about 36 years for us to sort of uh, uh, come up with the next uh, forest policy. And now it's uh, uh, almost another uh, 32 uh, years. We are still sort of uh, not finalized time in the next forest policy. So what we find is that uh, the change has been rather slow, and uh, basically you could sort of really afford to have the kind of, uh, you know, a long policy or a long program and other thing. But what we are seeing is that the pace of change is accelerating very rapidly. You know, the type of, for example, in the uh, 60s and 70s, if something took about, say, uh, 10 years or 20 years, uh, what you are going to see or what you are already seeing is that the same kind of uh, change that is actually taking place at a much uh, shorter interval. Now, uh, I, I always uh, remember, I mean, um, uh, this is something uh, very funny. I mean, you, you can visualize, you know, the kind of situation. Uh, in sometime in 1990, I landed in Sudan as a forest economist, uh, helping the, the uh, National Forestry Corporation to develop their uh, programs and plans, and especially to deal with the uh, issue of uh, uh, you know, they, are, they had uh, extensive areas of uh, savanna woodlands. Uh, they also had, I mean, a lot of uh, community forestry initiatives. So I was actually sort of involved in uh, providing all the technical advice and helping to improve their uh, capacity due to economic analysis and that kind of thing. So, uh, of course, the first thing I uh, did was uh, to get a kind of laptop. So this was in 1990. 
and the best laptop available at that time uh, the hard disk capacity was just uh, uh, 20 megabyte the hard disk capacity now a, a year later i just wanted an upgrade and then it actually sort of i could get only i think it's just about uh, uh, 80 or something like that 80 megabytes now look at the present situation now i mean you know uh, the, the kind of capacity and technical competence and change is so rapid. I think we, we have to really sort of understand that uh, uh, gradual change of research and education will not be able to cater to the kind of aspirations of a very rapidly evolving society. So how the world is changing? We have to look at, for example, the long-term changes and uh, societal transformation. Uh, now, for example, when you talk about the long-term changes, what we see is that, for example, there are major demographic changes. I mean, of course, in some countries, population is still growing rapidly, but there are quite a number of countries where population is actually sort of uh, plateaued, and in fact, uh, you find that uh, population is actually declining. You are also seeing, for example, uh, aging of population. Again, this is going to have tremendous impact on uh, forests and forestry. Now, a classic example I always like to quote is the situation in Japan. I mean, being an aging society, what we found that the demand for housing has completely changed over the last uh, three to four decades. And this had a direct impact on the demand for wood. And in fact, uh, in the 70s or 80s, uh, Japan was actually the leading importer of uh, tropical timber. But now, you know, uh, it, it really doesn't import much. And in fact, uh, uh, they have such a huge forest, almost about uh, more than 60%. They are actually sort of trying to export uh, timber from Japan. So uh, this is uh, you know, the kind of demographic change we have to. Economic change, in fact, uh, this is again, a whole lot of changes are taking place in terms of growth in income, the issue of uh, uh, structural changes in the economy. I mean, the share of primary sector like agriculture and forestry uh, in the uh, income, na national income, it's actually on the decline. We have a very rapid growth of the industrial sector and the services sector. More employment is actually coming from the industrial sector and the services sector. Uh, we are also seeing, for example, uh, globalization. Of course, now uh, we are slowly sort of uh, finding a situation where there may be a bit of uh, deglobalization, which is that's what a lot of the uh, experts really say, because what we find is that the global supply chains are finding it difficult, especially when we have disruptive changes like COVID. So uh, you, you, what you are going to find is that this enormous amount of uh, changes, what we find, for example, and then uh, technological disruption, which I already sort of uh, mentioned, we are going to see, for example, uh, the kind of... Uh, uh, disasters, natural disasters, which are going to have tremendous disruptive impact. And of course, uh, we'll have to really deal with this sort of uh, major uh, global challenge of uh, climate change and its uh, impacts. So what we are going to see is this kind of uh, long-term changes and societal transformation and disruptive changes. Now, uh, when we talk about society's uh, transformation. I think one question that we have to ask is that, uh, of course, this is a one question that I've been asked long time back, I mean, one of the famous publications by Marian Clausen, uh, for us, for whom, and for what? I think we need to really answer that. I mean, uh, uh, over a period of time, this is going to be repeated, and we need to really understand. Uh, of course, we can always say that uh, forestry for the larger uh, societal welfare. But that's not enough because uh, you find that, I mean, there are multiple stakeholders making claims on forests. And I think we need to really address this issue. And this is where a lot of the science and technology will come to help. It. Now, one of the things that we have to really consider is that our societies, uh, in the context of this, uh, demographic, economic changes, and technological changes, we are actually sort of undergoing a lot of changes. I think we have, for example, the pre-agrarian societies and agrarian societies where land is basically the 
a key factor of, for example, say in the case of the uh, pre-agrarian societies, essentially the uh, forest dependent communities, you know, they, they live as part of a forest or they are highly dependent on forest. When you move to an agrarian society, of course, there is a conflict of land. And in fact, uh, this has been actually the uh, historical battle between uh, forestry and agriculture. I mean, an expanding agriculture society always wants more land, and especially in the context of uh, rapid population growth. Now, I remember uh, when I was uh, working as a DFO in uh, Tutsur, I think this is when we had this enormous problem of uh, uh, shortage of food. And uh, one of the scheme, as uh, although I mean, I've been a kind of a traditional forester, one of the tasks which uh, I was asked to do is to identify uh, forests that uh, should be sort of given out for agriculture. We had actually called a grow more food scheme. And uh, one of the tasks I had to do was to sort of uh, identify and survey the area, uh, clear the trees. What you, what you find is that I mean, you have a, a pre-agrarian, agrarian societies is there. We have industrial societies. And in fact, uh, uh, most of our trust is uh, uh, on traditional forest management has been uh, focused on industrial societies. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, for example, how we raise the uh, teak plantations, uh, essentially for sort of initially for uh, supplying for shipbuilding uh, outside. Uh, and of course, uh, you all know the story of uh, uh, how we went on a very large scale for raising eucalyptus plantations, uh, clearing our natural forests. Uh, for supplying for raw material for the uh, pulp and paper industry. So uh, I think a lot of what we have been doing is uh, largely uh, catering to the kind of uh, industrial societies. Uh, but what we are also seeing is now there is a, a transformation of industrial societies uh, to the post-industrial societies where the emphasis is much more on uh, ecosystem services, for example, uh, recreation has become one of the key issues. So <clears throat> at the moment, uh, the greatest challenge with uh, forestry, or for that matter, land use uh, spaces is we still have uh, pre agrarian societies, we have still agrarian societies, we have industrialization, there is pressure for that. We also have a emerging uh, post industrial segment in our society. So what we have you now is this. Uh, enormous conflict between the different segments. Now, for example, uh, if you want to sort of uh, establish a, a protected area, I think you already know the situation. Now, just uh, this week, we have a lot of issues with regard to the kind of uh, environmentally sensitive zones, eco-sensitive zones uh, around the trials, you know. Now, okay. uh, one, one of the key uh, issues that we have to deal with is uh, uh, priorities in the coming decades. Uh, I think uh, the greatest challenges will be provision of ecosystem services like uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, uh, water, biodiversity, amenity values. These are going to become a much more sort of priority. And the point is that, I mean, the kind of uh, industrial uh, forestry uh, which we have been following in the uh, early, uh, almost uh, most of the 20th century, and even now, I think that is probably going to be completely, I mean, irrelevant. So ecosystem services, especially with regard to climate change, uh, mitigation and adaptation, I think that's uh, one of the greatest challenges. And I think... Sir, it's not audible, sir. Sir, it's not audible. Sir? Ah, I put a key at a boy. Hello? Sir, 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 s
I think um, uh, this is a challenge uh, when I'm, uh, you know, living in a uh, rural area. I mean, I'm all surrounded by a plantation. Uh, so uh, I always face a bit of a problem because this is uh, quite from, far from any uh, town or even uh, communication tower. So sometimes I get, I mean, normally this uh, doesn't happen, but uh, sometimes, I mean, this uh, really happens, you know. So I'm uh, completely in nature, so you always uh, find this kind of issue. Now, uh, coming back to the issue, uh, I think uh, you're going to see very rapid urbanization and the uh, an urban society is looking for uh, amenity values. And uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about the whole idea of uh, uh, forestry contributing to uh, health and well-being. In fact, if you go to Japan, Korea, and quite a number of countries, they are really talking about uh, the healing properties of uh, forests. Uh, so, in fact, uh, you have a, a, a science of uh, forest therapy has been uh, is emerging, and in fact, uh, uh, there they actually employ uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, forest therapists, and that kind of thing. So, the the whole idea of I mean. Uh, ecosystem services, I think it is getting completely transformed. <clears throat> the next issue uh, we have to deal with in the uh, coming decades is uh, reducing vulnerabilities through adaptive management to enhance resilience of uh, people and ecosystems. Uh, I think uh, you have already seen, for example, uh, what's happened due to COVID and COVID-19. Uh, we are also going to see a lot of other problems like uh, uh, climate change related, like floods, uh, landslides, uh, you know, uh, uh, sea, sea level rise. So what we find is that uh, what can forests do uh, to reduce uh, vulnerabilities for both ecosystems and uh, people? And I think uh, much more attention will have to be sort of uh, given to that. The third area is on green economies. And of course, uh, you term, of course, what they call as a bioeconomy. Uh, so uh, eventually, I think there is going to be a major shift towards uh, renewables. Uh, for example, now, uh, I don't know, the other day, I think uh, uh, Noel Thomas mentioned that in, this is when I was in the ministry, <clears throat> when uh, somebody mentioned that, I mean, you know, the use of wood is uh, uh, unfriendly, unenvironment, and, and in fact, uh, we had an order saying that uh, uh, nobody will use uh, wooden furniture. But I think the entire tide has now turned. And there is a lot more trust on using wood. In fact, wood is going to be, has become is one of the most uh, environment friendly products. Uh, and I think that that's good. And in fact, you know, a lot of the kind of uh, processing of our uh, chemicals and other things is also really going to come from wood and other sort of renewables. And I think uh, the opportunities are going to be very significant in these areas. Uh, now, uh, I don't know whether you are aware of that, I mean, there is a lot of trust actually to build even high rise apartments using this timber. Uh, I think the one, uh, the tallest that is actually being planned is in Japan by the Sumitomo Corporation. They want to have a uh, 350 meter, uh, I think, 80 storage, uh, uh, totally uh, timber based uh, construction. So, what you are going to see is a kind of uh, re emergence of use of wood because basically it is seen as a kind of uh, uh, carbon neutral, uh, low uh, ecological footprint material. So I think that uh, goes, you know, that's what is going to happen. So given these things, I think the boundary between uh, forestry, agriculture, etc. is becoming, you know, completely off. And in fact, we already know, uh, you know, for example, when we talk about uh, any of the ecosystem services, whether it is uh, uh, even production of timber, biodiversity, uh, watershed protection, I think all the I mean, agriculture also plays an equally important role. Now, we know, for example, uh, so uh, what we are going to see a, a lot of trust on landscape approach, because uh, there are a lot of uh, you know, work done on what are the appropriate principles of landscape approach. Where, uh, essentially, you should be focusing on uh, multiple stakeholders. You'll be looking at multiple functions. We are uh, trying to really look at the uh, relationship between the different components of land use. 
they will basically find mosaics and uh, continue. So there is uh, enormous work being done on this one. Uh, now, the other change what we have to really consider is that education focusing on uh, mass production of uh, graduates. I think that's going to be completely outdated. I think we need to really focus on individual needs and uh, uh, you know, we should not really sort of uh, fo uh, focus on uh, mass production of graduates raising the uh, skill sets and competencies. I think we need to really go for more personalized learning. I think that's the key shift. Now, <clears throat> coming to the kind of uh, job potentials, I think uh, the demand for traditional jobs and skills are uh, expected to decline. I think we are already seeing that. Uh, we have actually done uh, some studies on the kind of uh, employment uh, over the last uh, many years. And what we find is that employment in forestry is actually on the decline. Uh, of course, uh, there is a slight shift, for example, Asia is a slight increase, but most of Europe, uh, it is actually on the decline. So we find that forestry graduates in the traditional sense are finding that they are unable to get job. And I think slowly this is happening in a lot of other countries, including Asia. Uh, I know, for example, uh, China is finding it very difficult to find uh, jobs for their forestry graduates. And I know uh, to some extent that problem exists almost everywhere. So if you are really focusing on the kind of traditional uh, jobs and skills, I think it's, it's going to be challenging. Uh, a surgeon would demand in the context of growing graduates. I think that's going to be completely outdated. I think we need to really focus on individual needs and uh, uh, you know, we, we should not really sort of uh, fo uh, focus on uh, mass production of graduates, raising the uh, skill sets and competencies. I think we need to really uh, go for more personalized learning. I think that's uh, the key shift. Now, <clears throat> coming to the kind of uh, job potentials, I think uh, the demand for traditional jobs and skills are uh, expected to decline. I think we are already seeing that. Uh, we have actually done. Uh, some studies on the kind of uh, employment uh, over the last uh, many years. And what we find is that employment in forestry is actually on the decline. Uh, of course, uh, there is a slight shift, for example, Asia is a slight increase, but most of Europe, uh, it is actually on the decline. So we find that forestry graduates in the traditional sense are finding that they are unable to get job. And I think slowly this is happening in a lot of other countries, including Asia. Uh, I know, for example, uh, China is finding it very difficult to find uh, jobs for their forestry graduates. And I know uh, to some extent that problem exists almost everywhere. So if you are really focusing on the kind of traditional uh, jobs and skills, I think it's, it's going to be challenging. Uh, a surgeon would demand in the context of growing emphasis. I think that's, there's, it gives a lot of opportunity. Uh, so, uh, we, are, we are going to see a whole kind of new jobs coming up. I mean, uh, I was mentioning about EIA specialists. Now we have a lot of discussion on undertaking EIA and the whole controversy about the EIA notification. Now, if you really have to implement that, you need an enormous number of EIA specialists. At, at the moment, I think we are really short of uh, people uh, competent to do proper EIA. And I think this is going to be an area where a tremendous scope for transdisciplinary work, and we need people who are really competent with it. We need, if we are really focusing on uh, um, uh, urban forestry, we need urban forestry specialists, we need urban cultures, and of course, if you really extend the kind of uh, skills in for now, probably now with all the artificial intelligence coming up, we need people, people need, we need people who are competent to understand that and apply to forestry. Uh, blockchain technology of uh, basically uh, distributed ledgers for improved transparency and accountability is coming. So we need uh, people to work on that in forestry. So if you are looking at the traditional kind of uh, education and jobs, I think we have a problem. But on the other hand, if you sort of really diversify and uh, look into this, wow. sorry for this uh, you know, problem. Uh, so what, what I would like to emphasize is that, uh, uh, I mean, I've been so very closely associated with ICFRE uh, during its formative phase. And of course, I mean, uh, 
uh, very recently, about a few years back, with the Kerala State Council for Science, uh, Technology, and Environment. And I think one of the uh, major issues that we'll have to deal with is, one, the de-bureaucratization of research. And of course, we also need depoliticization. Uh, so without these uh, two things, I think the kind of uh, vision that we are envisaging in terms of uh, a seamless integration of uh, education, research, and practice, I think that is actually going uh, without it. And what has happened over a period of time is that we have created these big bureaucracies. And these big bureaucracies are, you know, uh, like any bureaucracy, I think it, whether it is at the, any level, big bureaucracies are very slow to change. And I think we need to create more agile uh, partnerships, collaborations, cooperation systems, and other things. Without that, and in fact, uh, I remember when the, uh, Kerala, the uh, science and technology policy of uh, Kerala was uh, formulated uh, at the beginning in 1975, 77. Uh, uh, this was when uh, Mr. C. H. was the uh, chief minister at that time, when all these institutes like uh, KFRI, uh, Center for Development Studies, and others. So we uh, formulated a policy at that time. And one of the things what was uh, written in the policy is that we want to make sure that the uh, sci scientific institutions does not imbibe the bureaucratic culture. And uh, what should be happening is that the bureaucracies actually should imbibe the science culture. Now, unfortunately, what has happened is that what happened is, is just the reverse. The scientific institutions have imbibed a bureaucratic culture. And I think this is going to be one of the stumbling blocks if you have to really deal with the emerging issues and make uh, forestry, or for that matter, land use, a more scientific uh, and education more sort of uh, interesting. And of course, creating you know, different. And I'm sure universities also have the same kind of problem. Uh, of course, we'll face, I mean, a uh, lot of uh, problem with regard to funding. Uh, I think there is always the challenge about uh, funding. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about, uh, uh, you know, user paid research or uh, markets and private sector investment and all, all those things. But one thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, the markets and private sector, they will only put money if it is profitable. And I think one of the problem with regard to land use and agriculture or forestry is that we are going we have a lot of public goods research will have to be done and i don't think anyone is actually going to invest in public goods research but i think this is a point that we have to keep in mind i think i'll come to my last uh, uh, slide unfortunately i'm unable to slow uh, show it uh, the future uh, i'm inclined to uh, sort of quote one of the uh, very famous, I um, mean, management guru. This was, I mean, he's no more. Uh, Peter Drucker. Uh, one, uh, and, uh, so he co says that the rapid growth of cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary work would indeed argue that new knowledge is no longer obtained from within the disciplines around which teaching, learning, and research have been organized in the 19th and 20th centuries. So basically, uh, th this is one of the key things which you have to keep in mind. Now, the other one, which I mean, I uh, you know quoted in one of the paper which I wrote about 16 years back, uh, looking at the future of forestry education, uh, as tree growing becomes increasingly integrated with agriculture and other land uses, the forestry profession is bound to change drastically. A demand for professional advice will shift towards those who can provide broad-based technical advice on all aspects of land use. I think this is the issue. And I think this is my last one. I'm sorry. Uh, unfortunately, I could not really show the slides and other things. But I think, uh, let us, I mean, if there are any issues, 